Hey, good morning. I'm happy to be here uh, early, so everyone can give me good grades. Uh, Christina and I good grades on our, on our form, nothing to yeah. compare us to. Hopefully you've forgotten all the good talks from yesterday, and now you have us. But So uh, again, I'm, um, I'm David Harvey. I uh, work in the Indian Health Service in Rockville, Maryland, in the headquarters uh, division section. Um, this is a, a collaboration. What we're going to talk about today is a collaboration uh, really that started about, I guess, six, maybe eight years ago for me when I was at the uh, John Hopkins University uh, completing a degree. And I uh, kind of, and I was at EPA as the uh, arsenic lead. And so I kind of combined the, uh, my experiences at, at EPA in the headquarters there with my knowledge of uh, Indian issues because I had previously worked in the Indian Health Service and kind of decided to look at exposures to arsenic on Indian reservations and kind of did a, uh, <clears throat> I guess my capstone project on that. And that then kind of start, started the wheels turning for some of the researchers, Anna Navas, who's not here, to kind of thinking about um, exposures to arsenic in Indian country and led to um, the research that we continue to collaborate on together today. So what I'm going to introduce what the Indian Health Service is, for those who don't know. It's an uh, agency within the uh, Department of Health and Human Services, uh, basically responsible for providing um, federal health care services to American Indians and Alaskan Natives, uh, primarily uh, like clinical services, pre preventive care services. There is an environmental health component of that, of which I, that's where I rest as a, an engineer. And there's also uh, uh, sanitarians or environmental health officers that work there. So as you can see on the slide there, the, the mission to raise the physical, mental, social, and spiritual health of American Indians and Alaska Natives to the highest level possible. And uh, the goal is to ensure that comprehensive, culturally acceptable, personal, and public health services are available to Alaska Natives and American Indians. So uh, specifically, what does the sanitation facilities construction program do to assist in this? Well, we kind of plan, uh, design, and construct sanitation facilities, so private wells, you know, point of use treatment where needed. Uh, on-site septic systems, community, community water and waste systems. And we also provide technical assistance for the operation and maintenance. Um, and we do this with plenty of partners because our appropriation is not sufficiently large enough to, to do that. We, we do have uh, 12 area offices, about 60 district and field offices, uh, so, and about uh, they're located in th uh, 38 states um, with about uh, 520 uh, staff. So we work in close proximity to the, to the tribes in, de in kind of identifying their needs and delivering the, the services that our program does. Um, a little bit more about the, the breadth of it, we've, we've tracked about uh, 400,000 American Indian Alaska Native homes. We have dots on maps for those. And uh, kind of annually, um, we've identified about 44% of those are in need of some uh, uh, sanitation facilities repairs or or, or installation of additional facilities uh, with a, a total need of about $3.4 billion for which we get funds for about $180 million through our appropriation and others. So the, the juxtaposition of the needs versus the, the resources provided are a little bit skimpy. Um, and so uh, we need the assistance of other partners like you see on this slide here with the CDC and the EPA, USDA, HUD, uh, Intertribal Councils of Arizona, um, you know, John Hopkins, University of Illinois, and RCAP, had, I slipped them on here later because I'd forgotten that, you know, here, so there's Dave Clark back there, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> so in uh, prep of this, I wanted to kind of try to project out why, we, why it's important, private wells are important in Indian country, and, and so, um, <clears throat> you know, we do have dots on a map um, that's a, it's a new, it's a new uh, place for us. We've only done that about, two, uh, about three years ago. And so we're kind of in the, in the crux of trying to uh, determine or uh, clean up the data to assign those dots to a community water system. And then, you know, by math, you can figure out the rest. Um, we're not quite there yet in our, in our data quality to be able to do that. So I kind of like ginned up uh, an estimate here utilizing the, the, our, our number of houses that we, we track and some population density estimates that are from HUD, which may be a little bit low. And then utilizing uh, data from um, from SIDWIS that kind of indicates like how many um, the population is attached to tribal water systems. So anyway, you kind of 
throwing all those numbers together, we come up with around uh, 224, um, 224 minutes, about a quarter of a million uh, people uh, kind of a, being served by private wells in Indian country, which represents about 18% of the total population that the uh, program is serving. So a significant part of that, um, a significant part of our, our, our services. And so kind of what are the challenges associated with private wells on, on Indian lands? I mean, kind of similar to kind of rural America, it's tested once, usually when we show up and uh, you know, there's a house without water, the uh, community water system is too far away to be connected. So okay, we'll, we're gonna, we'll install a, a private well for you. We, we drill that well, we test it, we ensure that it kind of is in compliance with the, the primary MCLs. If it's not, we offer a, a point of use treatment device to the, to the home. And um, you know, we give them uh, the owner's manual, because we're engineers, by the way, I didn't put that out there. We're engineers, we just give them the owner's manual and say, you could read this and figure it out. And then we walk out the door. <clears throat> and we hope for success. Now, that uh, has not um, occurred. And so as a result, that's kind of why we're, we're kind of partnering with uh, John Hopkins to uh, help, us, help us to develop communication techniques, hopefully that will be uh, ensure more success of the operation maintenance of these units. Um, because you know, our program doesn't have resources to go back out and retest uh, folks' wells. Uh, I know we've been working um, with the CDC recently, has had a, had a conference on um, trying to get the message out to tribes about the, the utility of having within their public health departments, like in states, some aspects of services for homeowners to kind of um, know where to go test and know, that, and know the risks associated with, with exposures. But our program is not, is not kind of geared up to do that. Um, again, I, I say here, limited use and availability of homeowner training materials. I mean, that could be uh, our own initiatives. I mean, there are stuff out there. You can do plenty of stuff in this room that I'm hearing about. And one of my objectives here is to kind of gather up some of the information, bring that back to the, the program and say, hey, it, it's out there. You don't have to kind of reinvent the wheel. And maybe the, home, the, uh, the point of use guide is not just the, the, the thing you need to be given out here. But anyway, that kind of, uh, kind of paints the picture for where we're at. We're, we're, we're an engineer organization that kind of installs stuff and, and walks away. Uh, and we'd, we, we needed some help from some of, the, uh, some of the, the deeper, softer side thinkers, and we were happy that John Hopkins is there to help us. So anyway, let's, I'll let Christine take it from here. Thank you, Captain Harvey. Um, so I'm an environmental epidemiologist, and my role in the project is more to help to facilitate the development of the intervention. I've been working with arsenic for 12 years now. I actually started in Fallon, Nevada, and I'll never forget the story of the woman's well we tested, and her well had 2,000 micrograms per liter. It was a crazy thing, um, and I was using a rapid test, and I actually did the test five times. And the women started to laugh at me and said that she already knew that it was very high. So, <laughs> um, And so today I'll be talking about our collaboration, which is any health service, but it's also um, the tribes that we're partnering with. Um, so we're partnering with Cheyenne River, Spirit Lake, and the Ogallala Sioux Tribe, um, and also we're partnering with Missouri Breaks Research Incorporated. And so you all may be very familiar with this USGS map that's showing the distribution of arsenic across the, the US. So the areas that are orange are darker are areas that have arsenic that are greater than 10 micrograms per liter. And so the circles here show the Strong Heart Study communities. And so the Strong Heart Study is a study looking at risk factors for cardiovascular disease in American Indian populations. And it's been going on since the late 80s. Um, and so as part of the Strong Heart Study, they're collecting urine samples within households. And so you can see that the households that are in North and South Dakota, as well as Arizona, have elevated arsenic. And so this presented the opportunity to use the urine as a biomarker of arsenic exposure and look at the health implications. Um, and so here is also a map of a, a zoom in of the Ogallala Sioux Nation. And you can see from the sampling here, the arsenic is also elevated. 
And so the work of Ananavas Asian, along with the strong heart study group, was able to show that chronic arsenic exposure in these American Indian communities led to an increased risk of heart disease, cancer mortality, as well as diabetes and kidney disease in these populations. And so I think we often struggle as public health professionals when people are like, oh, this arsenic exposure causing these diseases in our community. And so this study provided definitive evidence showing that association. And so we're, we're utilizing this to promote behavior change, communication messages within the communities. And so the objective of this study, which is called the Strong Heart Water Study, and it's a study within the larger strong heart study is to develop participatory interventions to reduce arsenic exposure in these American Indian communities that were part of the strong heart study. And so I'll first go through the aims of our study, the design, and then I'll talk about some of our current work. We've just started um, the, our third year of this grant and it's funded by the National Institute of Health. It's an R01 grant. And so our first strategy, our first aim, is to develop participatory interventions. And this is done through formative research and community engagement. And so this includes both qualitative and quantitative research. And really, the community participation is vital. And so we've included in-depth interviews, community workshops, which I'll talk more about our findings from that, um, to develop our interventions. And we're currently piloting them in a small subset of households to learn the challenges before we go into the larger randomized control trial. And so for this intervention approach, we're using a multi-level model. Um, and so often interventions are focusing just at the household level and not really looking at the larger context. And so for this project at the tribal level, we're working really closely with the tribal government to help to inform sustainable policies around arsenic mitigation. At the community level, trying to provide an access to water arsenic testing services within the community. And then at the household level, if households are found to have elevated arsenic, providing resources for them to be able to access arsenic mitigation. And then at the individual level, once the person has this arsenic removal device, how are we gonna encourage them to drink and cook um, using water from the filter faucet? And so here I'll go through our four key behaviors. Um, and as Deanna had mentioned in her presentation, what arsenic testing is just the first step. And so from there, you need to really encourage people to get the arsenic removal device. I'm sure you've all had experiences with people saying, I've drank from this well for a long time, and why should I go and use another one? And so what techniques can we use? What do we have in our toolbox to promote behavior change? Um, and so here I show the arsenic removal device that we're using. And so we're using an absorptive media filter. Um, and for the behavior change component, you can see there is the main kitchen faucet and then there's the filter faucet. And the, slow, the fl flow rate is slower in the filter faucet. So how do you encourage people to consistently obtain water from the filter faucet? And then the key behavior is being drinking water and cooking. Cooking is often forgotten by households. People really focus on the drinking water, but forget that if they're pouring that water in there to cook their pasta or their rice, that they're getting some arsenic in there also. Um, and so really emphasizing both behaviors. And then these devices don't last forever. And so they have to, people have to change the cartridge. And so how do you encourage people to do that? How do you provide access to cartridges that are affordable for households to install? All these factors we found through our formative research to be really important. And so tailoring interventions to try to intervene upon these challenges. And so the second aim of the Strong Heart Study is to actually evaluate the intervention that's developed. And this will be done by conducting a randomized control trial, which we hope to start this summer. And this will be the first randomized control trial of the participatory arsenic intervention in households in the United States. And so we'll use urinary arsenic as a biomarker of arsenic exposure. And so this will tell us if the intervention is working and if people are actually reducing their arsenic exposure through using the filter faucet. We're also planning to look at biomarkers of heart disease and respiratory health to see if we see any, if the intervention confers any health benefit within our study populations. And then finally, we're planning to look at the long-term sustainability 
And so my area is randomized control trials. And one of the challenges we often face is people only follow households for like six months. And then you're not really getting a true picture of what the situation is. And so in this study, we're planning to follow households from one to three years. And really, the goal would be to follow them for 10 years and see what the situation is in the households. Hopefully, we can get some additional funding for that. And so here I show the design of the randomized control trial. So I talked some about our interventions at the tribal level in terms of sharing the findings from the Strong Heart study and trying to inform policies around sustainable arsenic mitigation. And then the community level, the water arsenic testing and training health promoters um, to know about these studies that were conducted in their own community on the health implications of arsenic. And so the randomization is at the household level. And so the standard arm will receive the messages that any health service currently gives. Um, and this involves, again, installing the arsenic removal device and then also giving them the instruction manual and one replacement cartridge um, without any additional reinforcement over time. And then comparing that to a more intensive intervention, which I'll describe, um, where we do home visits, we call people to follow up to see how things are going. Um, and the sample size will be a total of 150 households in each arm and two participants from each household will be included in the study, so a total of 600 participants. And so the final aim of the Strong Heart Water Study is the dissemination of the results. And again, this ties back into sustainable arsenic mitigation policies, making sure the findings from these studies that showed health implications in these American Indian communities get out there so people know about it. And so now I'll go into our current work. We've completed our in-depth interviews, the community workshops, and intervention development, and our pilot is ongoing. And so we conducted 34 in-depth interviews. They were about approximately an hour in length, and here we show the key stakeholders that we focused on. It included private well users, as well as elders in the community, IHS personnel, So from the end of interviews, um, something that really came out in these American Indian communities was the importance of the aesthetic qualities of the water. People were drinking this water their whole life and they trusted it. Um, and so thinking about, so how do you encourage them to then use a filter? Um, so safety. So during the end of interviews, um, the participants often spoke about the contaminants relative to the chemicals from farming. Um, arsenic did come up. Testing was huge, and so they wanted to know, well, where can we go for testing? Um, how often do we need to be have our wells tested? And this is something I haven't heard anyone talk about today, but we've encountered challenges with temporal variability in arsenic concentrations over time. And so what type of recommendations should you give people on how often their wells should be tested? And then also, another issue um, is around the aesthetic qualities being linked with safety. And so we know this is problematic for arsenic because people can't taste, smell, um, or see arsenic. And so really, it makes it a challenge to encourage people to, to practice a mitigation option or use a mitigation option. And so we did interviews with people who had received um, the IHS intervention that Captain Harvey described, um, and were able to identify some of the challenges. A major one was, again, the replacement cartridge. So after the one cartridge that was given um, was spent, well, where do they go to get another one? And so there was a local supplier, but they were kind of price gouging. They were charging almost twice the price um, that we were able to get them for in our study and selling them to community members. And so most of the community members stopped using it because they weren't able to afford this new cartridge. The flow rate was a challenge. Um, and so this, we, we knew this, but we, it made us realize that we needed to tailor our intervention around trying to overcome this barrier that it takes a long time, but it's important for your health and for your family's health, and so trying to tailor messages around that. Um, also difficulties with children using the filter faucet. Um, so this was something we identified from the previous intervention, and so how to overcome that. Um, and then we conducted a community workshop last year. Oh, we had multiple community workshops, and so the one here, there were 27 participants, and this was in the Ogallala Sioux Nation. And we had 
very intensive participatory activities um, for the workshop where the community expressed their concerns, they were listed up, they were ranked, um, and based on that, we were able to decide on which interventions should be developed. Um, and so here I show the community's ranking of issues related to water. Um, and so you can see in terms of water quality, number one was communication of the water testing results. This was really important to the community members, as well as the need for education and information. They wanted to know more about contamination, um, and they wanted to know if you installed this arsenic removal device in my home, uh, how, am, how am I gonna be able to use it over time? Are you gonna provide another cartridge for me? Where can I obtain that? So there was a lot of overlap between the findings between the community workshop as well as the end-up interviews. The next thing was how to deliver the messages. So which communication channels did these communities think were, were most important to target? Um, and so they thought the utility bills were really important, that where, you're, where you can get your well tested should be listed in the utility bill. Mailings they thought were important, um, having posters up in the post office, using radio PSAs, and so this was really valuable to decide how this intervention should be delivered. And so now I'll go through the intervention we developed. And so the first key behavior was obtaining a test for one's private well, and so we had posters up in locations around the community, post office, grocery store, places where people go off in with pull tabs for a number for people to call. And so Missouri Breaks Research Incorporated is our partner. It's a, it's a tribal-owned research entity um, that was providing the water arsenic testing, so collecting the sample, and then we transferred it to a, a local laboratory. We also had newspaper ads, um, so Lakota Times. We had radio, um, so we had a tribal member that spoke about our project on the radio and encouraged people to call and get their well tested. We used mailings, and so there, the work that Jennifer Wilson did while she was at the EPA was really valuable for our project. Um, we also utilized the, the well care hotline that Karen Bridges mentioned yesterday, and I actually called them myself. And so I said that I was a private well user and, and grilled them on the, the different health implications of arsenic and questions. And I have to say they were just excellent. So they, they're really a resource for our project. So the next thing was deciding to install an arsenic removal device. And so this ties into how do you deliver people's arsenic test result. Um, and so we developed a mailing, again, using the EPA handouts that Jennifer Wilson created. And if a person had a arson concentration that was above 10 micrograms per liter, we called them. And we had a script around the messages that we provided around that. And I should also mention our partner laboratory, Mid-Continental, Mid-Continent Testing. And they've been great. Their turnaround time is 10 days. So it's been great to work with them. We also created a video where tribal members and a tribal leader talked about arsenic um, and the importance of using the filter faucet for both drinking and cooking. Um, we also created another video where we had a family talk about arsenic and what it meant to them. So this included children talking about why they were using the filter faucet, um, why it was needed, how did they motivate themselves to use it. We also had promotional items that were developed, um, so having cups and mugs, um, cue to action cards, so this uh, card on the bottom uh, right on the photo that's on the left is a cling that goes onto the top of the kitchen faucet, so whenever they go, or the back of the kitchen faucet, let me point here, so it goes in this area here trying to point to it there, um, so that whenever they go to the kitchen sink, they see it there. Um, and so these materials help to, we hope to serve as cue to actions to encourage people to use the filter faucet. For changing the arsenic removal device um, cartridge, there is an indicator light that's on the, the base of the, the filter faucet that flashes red. I can't see as well on this side. Um, the flash is red when it's time to, to change it, so households knew. And we have, are developing a video with a travel member that explains to them how to change the arsenic removal cartridge, as well as calling them to follow up on it. And so we are conducting a very small pilot, and the reason why 
we're doing this is we just want to make sure everything works before we start. And so we picked households of different types, ones that had more children, ones where it was just adults in the household so that we can test out the intervention and see how it was going. And it was also an opportunity to check out the arsenic removal device in this particular setting. So for example, we know high silica could be a problem and some of our households had high silica. So it allows us to test out the arsenic removal device in our setting before starting the, the main study. And so we followed these households for six months um, well, we had five in the intensive arm and one in the standard arm. We've done interviews with them. We've attested the, the water quality. And so Captain Harvey has really spent a lot of time um, selecting the water quality parameters and reviewing the data that we have related to that. And so some of the successes for the pilot that we found so far was that people were using the filter faucet and not just they were saying they were using it. We had a water meter on it. And so I could see that that there was actually usage of it. Um, and so we were, were really excited about that. We got positive feedback about the intervention materials and we found that people were using them in ways that we didn't anticipate. Um, and so earlier I had showed in the top left that tankard. And so we had that because the flow rate was slow. And so we encouraged people to fill it up and sit it on their kitchen counter so they can use it when they need it. And so some people are like, well, the kids aren't using the filter faucet. So we put Kool-Aid in there. Um, and then we found the kids are using the filter faucet all the time. And so household innovation. So people would only do that if they felt like it was really important. Um, and so I won't go through the quotes, um, read them to you, um, but things around the filter faucet helped to reduce some of the residues. So another aesthetic quality um, that people found that they liked related to the intervention, um, the things that we had around kids, um, someone quoted that their kids were now using the filter faucet, so that was a success. And this is from the interviews that we did. People seemed to like the intervention items that were provided. And so now going into some of the challenges, which were important for us to identify now before we start the randomized control trial, low household water pressure. Um, and so we're looking at sometimes 27, sometimes 30, 40 PSI. Um, and so that's really affecting the flow rate coming out the arsenic removal device. Um, and so we, we saw quotes like it's slow, but I'm in no hurry, um, but we know that it's a, a potential challenge. Also people wanting to connect um, the filter faucet to their refrigerator filter um, for the ice maker. And so we have concerns that this could reduce the flow rate even further. Um, and so how to encounter that, how to overcome that if we know people want to use the refrigerator filter. Um, and then some households didn't want to use the filter faucet until we showed them that the arsenic coming out of it was low. Makes sense to me, um, but it, it caused a delay in terms of the lab taking 10 days, and so them not using it for 10 days. Um, and then another challenge is going out and finding households that have elevated arsenic. We're working in really rural communities. Um, I was out to our partner communities a month ago, um, a household that was 13 miles off a gravel road. <laughs> so basically no road, and we got stuck in the mud. Um, and so you're thinking about doing the study year round, and so these are the type of challenges that we have to face. And so I just showed some quotes around that here. And so our upcoming activities are actually rolling out this trial. And so we're planning to do this in July. Um, and so we look forward to being able to present the findings from this study at a, a later meeting. So thank you, everyone. And please let me know if you have questions for the both of us. Um, so the last thing, sorry, <laughs> is I want to make sure I acknowledge all the collaborators. So we have Missouri Breaks Research Incorporated, um, Johns Hopkins as well as Indian Health Service. Our environmental consultants were completely, in, were com completely invaluable in terms of the implementation of the work that we've done so far, um, as well as the MedStar, um, which is kind of the, the home of the, the Strong Heart study, the larger study. And we also have ethical approvals from IHS, from the local Sioux tribe, as well as from Johns Hopkins. And this is a, our photo from our community workshop. So with that, thank you. <laughs> Any questions for uh, Captain Harvey or Christine? Mm -hmm. 
I was wondering, can you go over a little bit again on the intervention part that you, you say there's five visits? Mm -hmm. What is what are the five visits? Again? So they're actually visits of different types. Some of them are in person, and some of them we're just calling them to follow up to see how things are going. And so since we're working in really rural areas, um, going out to the households five times is very difficult, even if it's over a year long period. So we're using a combination of in person visits and phone calls. Thank you. And just another follow up question: You were talking about the cost being inhibitive or prohibitive for people replacing the cartridge. Mm -hmm. Have you figured a quick workaround for that yet, or what does that look like? So we brainstorm potential solutions. Um, one is to, to buy it wholesale and for it to be stocked by the tribe, but there needs to be tribal support for that. Um, another thing we, talk, we talked about was a local hardware store. Um, so having them whole, whole sale um, stocked in a hardware store, but the challenge there is the hardware store needs to be very sure people are gonna buy it. Um, and so we've been brainstorming ideas, but haven't decided on one yet. I just ask, did you talk to that one store owner who did provide the filter but at the highly marked up price? Like, is there any chance that might be an option? That is a Captain Harvey question. <laughs> <laughs> so these are, uh, so these are again, rural communities, not a lot of uh, contractors out in that part of the, part of the country doing work. And so uh, economics kind of like reigns. And so, you know, unless you're gonna, uh, appeal to the altruistic side of the individual, they may not want to do that. So really what we're trying to focus on is trying to uh, get a champion at the tribe, a tribal office, the housing office, the, the housing department has uh, housing stock, and perhaps this could be a value added piece to the tribe's uh, services, and they, they could purchase a bulk in bulk and then sell them at the, you know, at cost basis, and we'll see how that goes. I, th I think they were wanting to sell it around 100 bucks or something like that, and these are these are these are around 60 or something yeah. like that, 60 yeah, or 40. Yeah. yeah. Very high. <laughs> yeah. I uh, working in rural communities in Indiana, I've had some uh, misconceptions among homeowners about arsenic and and getting it out of the system. Are you guys seeing that people are like, can I boil the water to get it out? Is that a common theme that you're you're running across? I see it a lot. So that's a, a great comment. So yes, we have encountered that. So people think boiling, um, people think put some bleach down the wells, gonna get rid of the arsenic. Um, so those, we definitely saw those um, type of misconceptions during our end up interviews. And so in the materials that we're using, we make sure we address that. Okay, thank you. Sarah. Then just another question about the filter. Um, what <coughs> brand did you guys go with? Cause it looked like a certain one and how much was the cost? Um, so we decided okay. to go with multi-pure, and we have a wholesale price now, so. 40 bucks, uh, 40 oh, for the, you mean for the whole unit yeah. or the replacement yeah, cartridges? Yeah, you guys purchased the whole unit, right? Um, so the whole unit was $270. Hi, this is a question for David. Um, I noticed as you were calculating your estimated population, so you used an occupancy of 3.2 people per household, and at least in Indian country in northern Minnesota, there are way more people than that right. living in a household. Right. Um, and often very transient populations, crouch, couch crashing and that kind of thing. Have you thought about dealing with the visiting populations that aren't permanent residents in the houses? Um, you know that often there's 12 or 14 people living in a two bedroom house. Yeah, it's, um, I mean, what we're hamstrung with is, is by is good published data associated yeah, with that. Yeah. And so uh, I think anecdotally, our staff, when I had this reviewed internally, they're like, well, I guess 3.2 is the number that HUD says, but you know, my, ex my, my, my experience is that it's like four to five. Yeah. And so, you know, if there's, if there's ways in which those estimates can be done, I'd be interested in hearing about them to be able to kind of improve upon that. I mean, usually what our program tracks is just houses because we can count them on the ground very easily. But, you know, when you're trying to translate that into impact, uh, you know, a house or people, people makes a better, a better s statement. So I think I'm, I'm trying to move uh, the program forward to kind of gather that. So I'd be interested in hearing yeah. ideas about how to improve that. And then based on that, Christine, have you, have you considered in your intervention or talking to people how they deal with or how they um, encourage visitors to their house to use the filtered or the treated water? So that's a great question, and we have thought about that. Um, and so we have messages around serving the filter faucet water to your guests, because um, I agree that that's really important. 
So I have a question. Mm -hmm. um, are those videos that you've made available to anyone? Um, so right now they're available to our study participants, um, and so we hope to be able to share those in the future. Thank you. Thank you.